Hi, we're here at the Project Inspire convention talking about leadership. So we're already a bit into the talk and we went through some of the secular definitions of leadership. So now we're talking a bit about followers and leaders. So as we were saying, so this video shows how people uh, are there, right? This guy's crazy dancing like a, a madman and the next thing you know, the, a person joins him and is dancing with him and they start dancing and he holds his hand and then another three people join and the next thing you know there's a whole crowd, there's 50 people dancing on a beach and that is what it takes to create a movement, right? Or to create followers, right? That you do something, it could be outlandish, it could be crazy and people follow you. And that's generally when we think about leadership, you think about the way Warren Bennis explains it, the way many thought leaders and leadership talk about it, that you need a certain charisma, you look at some of the leading uh, business people, right? So who's the richest Jew in the world, you know? So it's Larry Ellison, who is he? Oracle. Oracle, exactly. Okay, so I did a project on him uh, two years ago or so and contrasting him with some of the other people. And you look at some of these secular leaders and they could have the worst possible personal character traits. They could be totally narcissistic. Or they could treat people horrifically. And for whatever reason, they're the ones in leadership. There was an article that came out a couple weeks ago about Amazon and the New York Times. And I don't know, did any of you see this? Are they, and I also did something on Jeff Bezos. So that they really took Amazon to task on the way that they were treating their employees. So Amazon fought back and they made 100 of their senior executives available for interviews. So they really fought back. But it happens to be when you look at our definition of leadership and usually when we think of what a leader is, the first thoughts that come to mind is a very secular definition of leadership. Just when you hear of people who are leaders and when you're looking for somebody who's a leader, it comes to mind that there has to be certain character traits certain ability to do things regardless of how things happen, right? How does Donald Trump rise in the ratings? The more he insults people, right? The more people look up to him. And it's mind boggling that it's hit a point that the way that you define, right, who could be the next president of the United States is the person who gives the best insults. And that's what's happening. And it's hit a point that even those presidential uh, candidates who do not want to fall to that level, they've had to because they realize that otherwise they're going to get swept by the wayside. So when you want to contrast that with the Jewish defini definition of what it means to be a leader, which so how does that work? So I'll tell you, I was speaking to one of the heads of rabbinic placement, and he said that this model of non-Jewish leadership has swept so much into the Jewish world that when they're looking for rabbis, in most shuls, except for the most religious ones, they want people who are in their late 20s, their early 30s, they don't really have to know that much, they don't have to have any life experience, they just have to be young, they have to be charismatic, they have to be funny, relatable, that's all they want. And he was telling me about himself, he was already in his 50s, he said, I am finished, okay? And he happened to have been more in the modern world, so he was saying that he for sure couldn't get a job today because there has been this youthfulness that we're looking for the next JFK or Bill Clinton or whoever else it is who's going to be young, who's going to be vibrant. And that is definitely very much a secular version of leadership. So when we want to look in the Torah and you want to say, what does it mean to be a Jewish leader? What does it take? What are the character traits? What are we looking for in order to be a Jewish leader? And when you want to think about who are the greatest Jewish leaders in history, right? So throw out some names. Who are the people who we epitomize as the leading Jewish leaders, right? Who would they be? You would say Moshe. Moshe is the most classic example. And when you look at Moshe's history, right? Although the fact is that he did grow up in the king's palace. But this was a man who couldn't speak. Right? He had a speak defi uh, speech deficiency. And this was a person who was not the most beloved by Kalal Yisrael. You see that after he passed away, they did not have the same period of Avelos like they had after Aaron. He did not have, he wasn't the most liked person in the world. He wasn't. And also, he had to come down very hard sometimes on the Jewish people. 
So how does that work? What was it about Moshe Rabbeinu that Hashem decided to choose Moshe as the leader? And yes, he was chosen already. There was already an R right, when he was born. But what was it about Moshe Rabbeinu that he took off? He became right, the Mimoshe Ad Moshe Lokam Moshe. that there's nobody else like Moshe Rabbeinu. A number of years ago, I was working in a shul that will remain nameless. And the shul is, is pretty modern. And there was a leading defense attorney who decided he wrote a book about Moshe. And it was the most complimentary book. And so they put on a play putting Moshe on trial for killing the Egyptian. So they had, on one hand, you had this leading uh, attorney who was the prosecutor. He was there to prosecute Moshe. And then they had one of the leading defense attorneys who constantly is in the news. He's in the news right now right, for defending some guy in pharmaceuticals. And so he was there to defend Moshe Rabbeinu. So you had this whole, you know, up against Moshe. So before that shot, the, that Sunday, I went over to the prosecutor, <laughs> to this guy who's a leading uh, attorney in New York, well-known name, and I said, look, you cannot give a talk about Moshe Rabbeinu when you don't know the first thing about him. Like, even though you wrote the book, I said, come this Shabbos, I'm going to devote my shir to Moshe. And I spoke about who Moshe Rabbeinu really was. What made Moshe Rabbeinu the greatest leader of all time? What was, to the extent that we know the uh, famous Gemara, Menachs, I believe, that uh, Moshe was showing an image of Rabbi Akiva, who was darshaning all of the lines on top of the words in the, right, the Targum in the Sefer Tyra. And so, uh, Rabbi, Moshe Rabbeinu, was, he had Chalisha Sadat, he says, how could this be? Have Rabbi Akiva like this? He should be giving the Torah. Until Rabbi Akiva was asked, he says, where do you have this all? And he said, we have it for Moshe Rabbeinu. Hey, but you, right, exactly. And you find that Moshe, what was so special about Moshe that he became the ultimate leader of the Jewish people today? What do you think? What is it about Moshe Rabbeinu? The only thing that comes to mind is An of Mikal Adam. Right, so Moshe was the An of Mikal Adam. That was number one. He was an An of Mikal Adam. And what was the other thing? Ah, so it was his care and compassion. And what was the first thing that Moshe Rabbeinu did? Right, it was mentioned earlier. What did Moshe Rabbeinu do when he realized that he was a Jew, that he was part of Klal Yisrael? What did he do? He went out, right, to help his brethren. That's what he did. And then what happened next? When was he finally chosen? When did it come to the sned that Moshe was chosen to be the leader of the Jewish people? What did he do over there? He was running after the sheep, right? He needed some water, and he picked it up. And he was there to take care of all of Hashem's creation. It wasn't just about my next door neighbor, my child, my friend, the person who wears the same strimal as me, right? or the same yarmulke as me, or the same shaitel as me. Right? It wasn't that at all. Moshe Rabbeinu was there for a little sheep. And you find throughout time that Moshe Rabbeinu, when you want to understand that what got him chosen for leadership, it had nothing to do with his charisma. It had nothing to do with his, speaking, with his speaking ability to the extent that when he told Hashem that he can't speak, so Hashem said, fine, you know, we'll have iron with you. Okay, but he had all of the aspects. He was a man who had to run away because he was on murder trial, right? So this man should never have been the leader of Kal Yisrael. He comes back. Kal Yisrael didn't even want to accept him. They didn't want to hear of it. So what was it about that? So Moshe Rabbeinu, he was the An of Mikal Adam. And the real key that Moshe Rabbeinu had is that he truly, truly cared about everybody. And how do we see that? To what extent did Moshe Rabbeinu care? And the greatest rise this week's Parsha. And Moshe Rabbeinu said he was so selfless that when Hashem offered to rebuild Klal Yisrael after the Chet Egel, and he said that I'll give you and your family, you'll be the future of Klal Yisrael. And what did Moshe say? He said, no. He said, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Because he had no personal interest in any of this leadership. It was 100% there for the other. And when you look at the beginning of Klal Yisrael, you look at Avram Avinu. 
And I find this fascinating. That Avram Avinu, Rav Asher Weiss spoke about this a bit yesterday, that Avram Avinu was not the first tzaddik in the world. He wasn't even the first person who taught Tyra. It's a whole question in Chazal that when Tyra was given down in the Messiah from Adam Rishon, there was a Messiah that eventually came to Nayach, came to Shem the Aver. But it's quite possible Avram wasn't even part of that Messiah, that he got a Baruch HaKadosh. So we don't even find that he learned in Yeshiva Shem the Aver. Maybe there are Midrashim, but I'm not familiar with that. Who was Misha? What? He learned under, right, Shem was his grandfather, but it doesn't seem that that was his time. He didn't spend, his son did, right? Yitzchak, he learned. But Avram himself, we don't find, and for sure in the Torah, right, in, in the Chumash, it doesn't talk about any of that part, right? It says, with Yaakov Avinu, there's a hint that he went to learn, right? But with Avram, we don't find any of that. Why is that? What is it unique about Avram? What do we find with Avram? That we find, it's also the Medrash, we find that he discovered Hashem, right, at whatever age it was. Let's say it was three, right? And he was willing to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And then what else did Avram do? What made Avram become the future of Kal Yisrael? And why was Avram different than everybody who preceded him? Why didn't Nayak? Nayak gave his life for Kal Yisrael. Why wasn't Nayak chosen to be the first Jew? What was it about Avram? <laughs> Ah, so what Avram did that was different than Nayak, and Nayak, by the way, Nayak was standing, right, for years, for endless years, he was building a teva. And that wasn't enough, right? He was giving his entire life for Hashem. No question. That was the life that he led. But even so, that wasn't enough. And shame clearly, right? Shem was the tzaddik, and that still wasn't enough. And that whole generation just wasn't enough. But Avram had something unique. And it wasn't what Avram knew. And it wasn't his learning even. Right? At least that's not what's mentioned in Chazal. What's mentioned is the fact that he cared about somebody else. And not about Jews. Right? There were no Jews in that time. So what did Avram do? He just wanted to, to spread the word of Hashem in the world. That's all Avram did. And that's why he's called Avram Ivri, Right? He stood against the entire world. But how did he do that? is that he went from place to place trying to find where people are that he could teach them and he could bring them closer to Hashem. But where did it come from? Where it came from is it was a personal care and concern for each person. And how do we see that? Because it's very interesting that we have many Midrashim and many Mamari Chazal. However, when you look, what, what does the Torah choose to emphasize? Right? When you have with each one of the others. The Torah talks about each one of the Avis in their own way. And with Avram, what does it choose to emphasize when it talks about Avram? So, right, right. So you have that. And you also have, right, with Vayera, that he had the Achnasis Arch, right? That was the other component. But the first component that we find is that Avram, right, that was in the making of Avram that Avram went out to greet idol worshippers. They were pagans. Right? Sometimes you think that they're Arabs. They show them in these kids' books, right? So you have a kafia, and they're coming in, and they, they uh, worship uh, you know, Muhammad. But it doesn't work that way. These were people who were Aivdeh Avedizara. They were mamish idol worshippers. And what did Avram do for them? Is that he brought them in, and he washed them up, and he gave them food, and he gave them drinks, and he did everything that he could just to help out these people. And yes, right, we have in Chazal, it doesn't even mention this in, in the Torah. This is unbelievable. And the Chumash, it doesn't mention this, right? It's Mamari Chazal. They used to have them, you know, bench as a result. And that was the whole point. But what do we find that's accentuated is his care and compassion for others. And that's how Avram became the first Jew. And that's why the Gemara says that anybody who lacks these three traits, it's a raya that they're not from the children of Avram Avinu. And what are they? It's Rachmanim, right? They have to be merciful. Baishanim, they have to be bashful. And Gaim Lechasadim, they have to be kind. And that's how we know that somebody truly, truly is Mizera Avram. That if you find that somebody cares and somebody's kind and they're compassionate just because they're there for somebody else, that they have nothing in it for themselves. That's the key. So when you want to look at the first character trait 
of becoming a Jewish leader, what's the first, first trait that you need? Is you have to care for everybody else. And it's not just the people who you're hired by, and it's not just the people who you, your direct constituents. It's, the, it's every single person. But I think uh, we all know Chabad has made a big emphasis on this. A Chabad Bacher one time told me, he said that the hardest mitzvah, or mitzvah, he said, of the Rebbe was v'ahavtal racha kamaycha. Is that you have to work on this every single day, that to really, truly care about somebody else. And that it's so hard, but where do you find, in any of the secular literature, in any of the secular literature, when it talks about leadership, that it says that you have to truly care about each and every person. Because if that was truly the litmus test to be a leader, then none of these people who are in the running or who are in many leadership positions in the top firms or who come to mind would ever, ever meet that test. And you find Steve Jobs, they're in the news, Apple's in the news again. Okay? And I think this is such a classic example because it goes back to the DNA of Apple. That why is Apple in the news? because they refuse to help the, the FBI right, to unlock this phone. And who knows what the real story is? Knowing what the NSA knows, they probably already have all the information. It seems like a whole PR uh, back and forth. But who knows what the real story is? Regardless, what's Apple saying? What they're saying is that we don't truly care about everybody in the world. We care about ourselves. We care about our clients. We don't want to lose our customers. We know everybody knows that we used to give over everything to the NSA. So now we're trying to pretend like we don't. So you know, let's do this. But where does that come from? What's the DNA? So the DNA of Apple, and I'm not an Apple guy. I don't know if anybody here is into any Apple stuff. I'm very much not, but my wife is. So Apple, OK, Steve Jobs is one of the leading authorities in business, right? He was. And if you read his biography, there was an incredible biography put out. And what was the big, it was terrible. what was, right, who was really Steve Jobs? If you really look at him, this was a man who created a revolution in the world. Right? He used to say in marketing, he says, we don't do so much market research. Why? Because the customers themselves don't know what we want. We tell them what they want. And that's what he created. He created a feeling of inadequacy in the world. Because wherever you go, you feel that if you don't buy this very expensive Mac or iPad or iPhone, then you're a nobody. And that's what he did. That was his concept of leadership. His concept was, and that's why, by the way, everything is called what? The I, right? It's the iPad, the iPhone, the I this, the I that. Why? Because that's all he was talking about, right? He was probably one of the greatest narcissists. And you see the way he treated his own family. And he treated the people in his company. It was the most horrific, horrific manner. The stories are just mind boggling, the way he treated everybody. But how does the world look at Apple? They look at it that this is the cutting edge, this is innovation, this is the future, this is where we all have to be. And when you look at the Jewish version of what it means to be a monarch and what it means to build up our own Jewish leadership, we see it's diametrically opposed to everything that's out there. Not everything, by the way, because we do find that the Kohen Gadol had to have certain character traits. He had to be tall. He had to be rich. He had to have a certain level that people looked up to him. So we do find that. However, for the people who are the real manhigim of Klal Yisrael, who passed on the Torah from generation to generation, there was never that goal. Rabbi Maisha Feinstein was one time asked by the New York Times, how do you become the Gadol Adar? How does this work that you become the greatest halachic decider, at least in America? Do you know what he said? What did he say? He said, one person asked me a question, and then they liked the answer. They told somebody else, and somebody else asked me a question. Correct. So Rabbi Maisha told them, he says, it just happens. It's organic. Right? This person asks, this person asks, this person asks, and the next thing you know, he becomes the big Gadol Hadar. There's no elections, there's no formal process. And you see this in Eretz Yisrael as well, that when you look at the Gadol Hadar, right? let's say Reb Chaim Kanievsky, right? how does it work that in order to have somebody like a Reb Chaim Kanievsky in the world, right? how does he become Reb Chaim Kanievsky that you see um, 
I feel like sometimes the Litvish Gedalim have become Hasidic Sherebas when you have all these literature that comes to everybody's house all the time, right? Showing this person gives a picture for this bracha, for this thing, right? Everybody's together. It's the famous story that they say, I don't know if it's from the Sat Marav, that somebody was talking about Hasidim and Lit and, and Misnagdim and who knows what. And he said that there was one time this fellow who had three daughters. You're familiar with the story? He had three daughters. And the first daughter, ends up uh, being mashadach with this person. And the person says, look, I only eat fleshics. That's it. Fine. So they were eating by cast. You know, he lived by the father-in-law. So he set up a table that was only fleshics just for this couple. And then the next daughter gets married. She married a guy who only eats milchiks. Fine. You know, they eat milchiks. And then there's this other person. The third child gets married. Right there, vegetarian. So they have to eat separately. And so you have their four tables in the same house. And Nebuch, one day, this fellow loses all his money. And they're all eating potatoes. So he goes over to the first son-in-law, to the oldest son-in-law. He says, why don't you join us? You're eating potatoes. He says, yeah, all of my potatoes are fleshic. He goes to the next one. He says, my potatoes are milking. He says, why can't we just sit together just with the potatoes at least, you know? And so that's what I think it's quoted from Samarov. I've heard it from others. He said, today all we have left is the potatoes, so we're all together. But that's just an aside. So you see, how does somebody like Rav Chaim or Rav Aaron Leib or whoever else it is, how do they become Gedailah? How do people start reaching out to them? It's an organic process because people recognize within them a certain authenticity. It's not their charisma. It's not necessarily all of these general character traits that we look for throughout the world in leadership. It's because who they truly are and that they truly cry and they care for every member of Kalal Yisrael. There's so many stories that I could share with you. I'll share with you a few because we don't really have that much time. But you look at in the past hundred years, which names come to mind of leaders who made a revolution in Kalal Yisrael? You would say the Chavetz Chaim, right? The Chavetz Chaim comes to mind automatically. And what did the Chavetz Chaim do? What was his formal position even? My, my grandfather learned in Rodden. And what, what was his role in the community? So it doesn't really seem like it was that much. It wasn't right? right? Right. And he would. He went from town to town. This is what he did. What was he? He went from town to town to meet Joseph. Right. He gave drushes, he sold his farm. Right? He wanted to make sure that he had an honest parnasa, and he sold his farm. That's what he did. But what happened as a result is that people saw the authenticity. They saw who the Chavetz Chaim was. And he became the amazing person. But why did the Chavetz Chaim do what he did? So he wrote the Mishnah Brura. He wrote Chavetz Chaim right, and many others' farm. And actually, Chaim Sadas, one of his farm is one of the most widely quoted farm for the Chiv of Kirov. Right, is he talks all about why we have to do Kirov. And he wrote a safer for soldiers, Jews, who were in the Russian army. And he did, he, he had Klal Yisrael on his shoulder. But what was it? It's because he saw the need, that he felt that the machle is that we have to care about Yanam. And that's why he had he, the Chavetz Chaim, right? It's a novel approach, what he did. Right? And he writes this in the introduction to the Sefer Chavetz Chaim. That it's a novel thing that he decided that everybody has to learn about Hilchashmir Salashin. Even though it existed. It was in Mamari Chazal, but he said he never found it, that it was all compiled together. Who else comes to mind? Who else made a revolution? Who else really cared about the world? Satmarav. Satmarav. Right. So the Satmarav came to America. Okay, and it's unbelievable. I tell people all the time that if you look at the way the Torah world is built, it defies any logic. I do, I'm doing a PhD now, and my research is in Jewish identity. And one of the things that you look at in the research in the past 50 years, and you read all of the sociologists and everybody else's prediction for the Torah world, they all felt that it was a dying entity, even Ben-Gurion. Right, when he was willing to make the deferment for the yeshiva bachrim, he said, ah, it's a couple people on the side, right? nothing will come of them. And it's just unbelievable how in the past 15 years, the past 15 years, which that's really where the big revolution happened, it's very, very recent, where we've seen the shift, it's so dramatic, was 
the non from schools have gone down in the past 15 years by 20%. And the firm worlds have quadrupled many times over. And there's a study that's put out every five years by the Avichai Foundation. And they found, I mean, you look in Lakewood alone, they went from 5,000 to 15,000 school children. And it's growing every day, Kanainhar. And you have in so many communities, and you look what Samarov came to America, and it made no sense to rebuild Satmar in America. It makes no sense. And if you ask anybody, it made no sense. None of this. You look at Ravon Cutler. He said, we're going to reestablish China in America. I went and saw an incredible article contrasting what Ravon did in Europe to what he did here in America. And it was so different. His focus in America was on rebuilding Tyra in America. And even, the, even though on a personal level, he was very active in the Vadlat Sala and Chinechat and other causes. But with the yeshiva, his only focus was to rebuild Tyra. And that's what he did. Because he cared about Yanam, he cared about Klaus Joel, and Hashem helped. Right? So it's not as though he had this majestic business plan. Right? I don't think that the Panavizharov had any big business plan. Right? He just said, I'm going to go and rebuild Tyra. That's what he did. And I think one of the greatest examples are given is there's a famous story with the, um, I'm trying to remember his name. It was in Hebron. It was the Mashkir, I think, in Hebron, of Sarna. So he got up to speak at a family gathering. And they knew he was a sharp mensch. And he gets up there. And they weren't so sure that it was the right venue to have him speak. And he says, I want to tell you. Who was the greatest person who lived in the past 100 years? And they're like, maybe you should sit down, right? This isn't the right place. You can never get everybody to agree. And he says, not only that, this person, and I'm going to tell you this person's name, you're all going to agree with me. And this person didn't even wear a yarmulke. <laughs> like, how could this be? <laughs> yeah. And he says, this person was Sarah Schneer. And she created the Beis Yaakov movement. And it's unbelievable. What was she? She was a seamstress, right? And she got inspired by a Talmud of Rav Hirsch. And because of that, she decided to do something as a result, because she saw the need and she cared. So on a Tachlis level, I mean, probably the greatest example, one more. And uh, this is something that, that I always find mind boggling, is Rav Meir Shapiro. So Rav Meir Shapiro died very young. And he has two incredible accomplishments that everybody talks about, aside from the fact that he was a brilliant, he was a Renaissance man, he was part of the Polish Sem, the, the parliament, and he built up an incredible yeshiva, really the first of its kind in Europe, with the dorm and with, you know, it was just, I've been there several times, it was an incredible, incredible building, what he did. But one of the greatest stories that they say is the way he started Daf Yaimi. But is that how did he even come to this idea? The idea is not the most brilliant idea. Right? I'm sure many people have thought about it, that you learn. Right? Everybody learns. So I would be very surprised if nobody ever thought of this or it was never written about. But he had the perseverance. He decided that he's going to do what it takes to make this happen. And he, the story goes that he spoke with the Chavetz Chaim, and the Chavetz Chaim told him to come to the Messiah Gedalia and to come in a bit late. A story is recorded. Dershu put out a safer. On, on, on Tyra in general. And so they have the full story in there. And he comes in, the Chavetz Chaim stood up. They see the Chavetz Chaim stood up. Everybody else stood up. And then he comes to the front. And he was speaking about this vision that all of Klal Yisrael, wherever you go in the world, everybody's learning the same daf. And it, it's, it's incredible. And, but how did that come to fruition? So the story goes that on Rosh Hashanah, they weren't sure if it would really take off. He said, Rosh Hashanah is going to happen. And so the Ger Rebbe was saying good yomtiv to everybody. And all of a sudden, he gives a clap. And he says, we're starting Brachas Daf phase. And he had everybody started the Daf at the same time. I always thought it was just the um, Rameer Shapiro. But clearly, the Ger Rebbe and the Chavetz Chaim had a big yacht in it. But what was it about them? What was so unique about it? is that they saw a need, and they cared for Klal Yisrael, and they said, this is what we're going to do to build Klal Yisrael. So what does it take? We only have like three minutes left. So what does it take to become a great Jewish leader? So there are three levels of leadership. The first level of leadership is personal leadership. It's to become a leader over yourself. When Shleim Melech 
was being pursued. He said that he became a leader over his staff, his job. That's it, right? You become a leader over yourself. They quote from Rabbi Saul Salanta. I've heard it quoted from others, right? That his whole life, he tried to change the world, then he tried to change his country, his city, right, his community. Then he realized he has to change himself. And that's the first step. Because before we could go out to go make an incredible difference, and all these examples that we gave, these were all people who are ice garbage that mentioned that they worked on themselves. That's who they were. And that's the first level. The first level is to make sure, A, that we're a Ben, a Bas Tyra, and B, that we're Shemir Tyra Mitzvah, and C, that we're engaged in a process of personal growth. Right? So be it in Musr and Chassidus, whatever it is that works for you, but in a constant process of personal leadership. And I feel that oftentimes when you talk about what it means to be a leader, so this first step is usually the one that gets overseen. Because if you don't have a foundation, if the person themselves is not through and through, Taichai Kibara isn't a real person. So then, obviously, whatever they're trying to do to the world isn't going to help. There have been, unfortunately, in the past number of years, there have been many scandals with people who call themselves rabbis or they're in chinuch positions. And you wonder for yourself, how does this happen? How is it possible that you could have every scandal is too much? And they always say that Baruch Hashem, these scandals pale in comparison to what's out there in the world. However, it's the classic story of when Dog bites man, nobody talks. Man bites dog, it's all over the news. But unfortunately, it happens too much. There are many websites and blogs that are dedicated just to exposing the failings in the firm community. And it's terrible. But where does it come from? Where do a lot of these failures come from? In Baruch Hashem, there aren't that many, but everyone is highlighted all over the media. Where does it come from? And usually, the root cause is because they never got to this first step of leadership. They never were actively working on themselves. Is that they could have gotten into such a rut that they're busy, whatever role they have, right? They're busy running this organization, doing this, doing that. Maybe originally they got in because they were more lishma, but then over time they neglected this side of it, that they weren't truly anymore a level one leader. And then what's the second level of a leader? is that you mentioned earlier that you need followers, right? So the second level of a leader is to have an impact on your immediate surroundings. Not only your family, your family is more included in level one, but it's your community, right? It's, you have many people who are askanim, who make a difference in the world. That's the second level, which is to look beyond yourself, is to try to see what could you do for the world. And what's the third level? The third level are those people who Taka made an incredible revolution in the world, right? Those Sarashneers, the Sat Mirebe, the Chavetz Chaim, you have so many of them, of people who really decided that they are going to do whatever it takes to try. They didn't know, Ramir Shapiro never knew it would take off. Chavetz Chaim didn't know his safer wouldn't just sit on the shelf gathering dust. He never knew. It's like oftentimes you see many of the people, even in their generation, like the Rambam, you look at the Ramchal, they were vilified in their generation. But over time, history proved that these people were lishma and they talked and made a revolution. So on a very practical level, what does it take for us to rise to become a leader? So the first step and the most important step is to set a goal for yourself that without real goals, we will never get anywhere. And this is one of the biggest, biggest challenges that people have, is that they don't have any personal goals. And they should really be written goals to figure out where we want to go. So if somebody doesn't have shaifas in life, if they don't know what they want to do in terms of for their personal avayda, then it's going to be very, very hard for them to get there. So you find, obviously, everybody has to be a Shemr Torah Mitzvah. However, I spoke earlier about the idea of individuality, is that the Bali Musr say that how does somebody find their own individual contribution to the world, right? Everybody was created. How could the Gemara say that everybody is chayavadim, right? How could everybody say What does that mean, that it's created for me? Which means that every single person, right? that every single person has their moment. They have their contribution. They have the reason why they have to be in the world. They have their top kid. So how do you find that? 
So you find your personal natias. You find your, the things that excite you that are obviously within the confines of Tyra and your Shemayim. So you find those things. Then you say, what could I do? What are the needs in that realm that I can make a difference with? But there are many people who realize that. There are many people who have tsarists in their own life. But that doesn't mean that they start organizations. It doesn't mean that they start a gemach, right? You go through any gemach directory. And oftentimes, the reason why people start gemachs is because they themselves needed a pacifier at night or a stroller or whatever else they needed, right? So they give it up. There are many people who didn't need it, right? But oftentimes, that's where it comes from, is to figure out what do you personally, what are you interested in? And then you go from there to try to figure out how you could make a difference. And that could be on a micro level, that could be within your own family, that could be within your immediate community, and then obviously it could be on a global level. However, probably the greatest thing that we need in order to have that global Hatzlacha is obviously it's Siata the Shmaya. Because um, there are many Gemaras that talk about this. But the only way the only way that we'll be successful is through incredible siyat of the Shema. And you have so many people who tried to have incredible Hatzlacha, and they just failed. And you look at many yeshivas. Uh, there, there are some Rashi yeshiva who are brilliant Talmidah Chamim, and they don't get any Talmidim. Then you have others who aren't necessarily such great Talmidah Chamim, and they could be overflowing with Talmidim. And there have been certain yeshivas that will remain nameless, who Rashi yeshiva tried whatever they could to stop Bachram from going there, because they felt that they weren't getting the right midas from those yeshivas. But what happened? But there's a certain siyat of the Shmaya that Hashem gave Hatzlacha to certain people. So obviously, to become that level three leader, that you'll change the world, that every level requires a lot of siyat of the Shmaya. But that is an incredible, incredible um, aspiration. But you need a lot of tefillahs and a lot of siyat right? You look at Rav Neich Weinberg, who created Eishatar. He started 10 different organizations. And in every case, there was a story. But regardless, it didn't work out for him at any of them until he created Eishatar. And even at Eish, there were many challenges along the way. But he kept to it. And he said, I'll do whatever it takes. Neve Yerushalayim, Rabbi Refsen, who created Neve Yerushalayim. So he originally wanted to create a boys' yeshiva. And he put up signs in B'nai Brak for a boys' yeshiva. And a few girls showed up. So that's how he created one of the greatest Kirov schools of modern day. And that's where it comes from, which is that you have to try. But the main, main Nikuda, and, and I'm going to end with this, and then I'll tell you a quick story, is that Rav Yaakov Weinberg told the Mechanech who asked him, what are your greatest tips for Chinuch? And he said, there's one tip. And that tip is that you have to love them. You have to care for every one of them. And it'll make all the difference in the world. And that the only way to truly become a leader is to first really decide that I truly, truly care for everybody. Right? And I'm concerned. And it's not coming because I have a need to be a leader. I have a need to be in a position of authority or of leadership. It's coming because you really have that need to, for care and concern. And I'll end with this story that when Rabbi Avram Kravitz from Detroit, I'm from Detroit originally, so when he was Nifter, Rabbi Isaac Osband was masked at him. He eulogized him. And he said that by Sadaim it says, Hamachasa anime Avram, am I going to hide from Avram that which, has, which I'm going to do? And this is what you mentioned, Lamana Shayitzava, Espanov, right? And then what did he say? Lasais Tzedaka Umishbat. He says, What was the message? that Avram was giving over for the future generations was Lasai Siddhaka Mishpat. And he said, at the time of Avram, this is Rav Isaac Osband, this is what he was saying, that at the time of Avram Avinu, there were other great people. But Avram was there to ensure that it continued on for the future. Right? That what did he do? That he went out to go find everybody and bring them back to Kalal Yisrael. Because he said, I'm not going to leave it up to chance. And I want to tell you that the one message that you should take out from this topic of what does it take to become a great leader is that you truly, truly, truly have to care about every single person in Kalal Yisrael, but even beyond Kalal Yisrael. 
You have to, as you look at the Avas, and you see that they cared about every sheep, and you look at some of the greatest stories with the Gedailam that they have, and I saw, I think, Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zunfeld, how he would feed the cats, and you have so many others, that they talk of Arachim of al Maslam, that they care about every single person. And the greatest machla, I would say today, that I think that's going on in the firm world, the greatest machla is that Baruch Hashem, we've grown. And Baruch Hashem, there's incredible things going on. But unfortunately, the reason why institutions were created was to help the next person. But oftentimes, it becomes about the institution in and of itself. And people forget about the yachid. And I was going to conclude with that story, but I'll conclude with this story. Is that earlier this year, there was a girl who I was involved to get her to go to Eretz Yisrael. She was not from, and she went to seminary in Eretz Yisrael. And really, it was the wrong fit. She never should have gone. Regardless, she goes there, and the school decided that they want to throw her out. So what do they do? So what do you do with the boss Yisrael, right, who isn't the right fit for your school? What do you do with her? Try to find another school. Try to find another school. What they did was is they put her into a taxi, and they sent her off to a hostel. And they said, good luck. You're on your own. And I called them up. I said, I don't understand you. Do you care about Klal Yisrael? Do you care about every single person? Who cares if she's about your school or not, right? You, you won't have a school if you don't really care about each person. Bring her into your own house. Take care of her. But don't ever, ever allow Abbas Yisrael or any member of Klal Yisrael just to go out onto the street. It was so mind-boggling to me. And, what, and afterwards, they tried to make up for it. But that's really the message. The message is, if we want to truly be a leader, if we want to make a difference in the world, the first thing that we have to work on, and the thing that we have to continuously work on, is our Abbas Yisrael. Thank you so much for coming. And I believe that there's uh, some other topics right now.